Hey everyone, hope you're all safe and well out there. Uh, yeah, hope you're all um, muddling through okay. It's been a very strange start to the year, but um, we're rolling on through it now. I guess um, took me, a, must admit, took me a while to get going um, this year. Usually I jump in straight away, but um, yeah, just had a, a few things. My, yeah, my, yeah, my mother passed away. Um, just after Christmas and my wife's grandmother passed away New Year's so yeah it's just taken a little bit of time to get up to uh, full driving speed but I'm here now and uh, yeah I've just been getting on with some work and some sessions have been coming through which has been great uh, it's been really good to keep your mind active and uh, yeah I hope you're all getting on okay out there and uh, I do know that you know. I do feel that we're gonna we're gonna get through this soon. Um, I know everyone, all you guitar players out there, are missing doing live shows and gigs and being even being able to get in a room with someone and play. But we will get back to it. I know we will. So um, just going to answer a few questions that I've had um, over the last couple of months. Thank you so much to everyone who's been sending in questions. Um, you know, I'm, I know I'm just starting out with my YouTube channel, but it's been nice to uh, have a few interactions with people out there, and um, I'm really enjoying it. You know, when I when I get the time to do it, um, in between doing bits of teaching and, and sessions that I do, I really enjoy it. It's good fun. So um, my first question here uh, is from Michael Power Powerierski. Michael Powerski, I think is I, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. Um, and I think this was a question that was it come through on my last video, which is where I t was talking about doing remote sessions. So uh, says here, have you ever taken on a job where you were pretty sure it was all going to be fine and thought to yourself, you aren't adding anything? And if so, did you record parts anyway and send them over? Uh, he then goes on to explain about uh, a session that he did recently got an offer to record some guitars immediately jumped on it and when I listened to the track although I wasn't I was into it uh, I just didn't hear the need for a guitar part due to the existing arrangement and the keys were quite dominant um, yeah he does elaborate on that a bit more yeah I've had that plenty of times I've had that where you get the song over you might think yeah this is great but you can't really hear um, you can't really hear where does this need guitar? Um, and that's where you, how I do it, how I've done it, dealt with it in the past, is I will have a very delicate um, conversation with the client, the artist, the producer. Sorry, I just uh, cut away there because my amp was buzzing like mad in the background. So getting back to that subject. Um, yeah, so I, I would have a, a, a delicate conversation with the uh, producer or the artist and I would just say, you know, I, I would be kind of asking them where, what sort of direction they want. But this would come at first from, you know, uh, talking about the job initially, just asking the, what kind of vibe they want. If they're adamant that they want things, you know, I, I could, you get creative with sounds. You know, you start doing some sort of soundscape stuff on the guitar, um, you know, stacking up a couple of reverbs together and sort of doing some real sort of background textural things. Uh, I'll always try and give something because you never... Nowadays, there's so much work that can be done after the fact. Um, people do a lot of stuff after you've sent your parts in and they might hear it in a completely different way to you um, and I kind of just go along with if they're happy with it then I'm happy it's great if I can help a song sort of come along but um, but yeah I mean there's been plenty of times where I've heard I've done stuff and I've sent in the guitar parts and then the thing gets released and there's no guitar on the track so um, that's what I meant you know, you really have to have a quite. A, you've got to have an ego to do this job, and I don't. By saying ego, I don't mean walking into the room and going, "Yeah, I'm the best." You know, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the shit. You know, I'm the best thing around. I don't mean it like that. I mean, you've got to have an ego to step up and deliver something um, that you like and and that you feel proud of. Um, but that ego is going to get bashed all the time. 
you know the, the guitar parts are never mixed as loudly as you want them to be when you hear it back or you know I've done things where I've I've received the guitar part back and you know all of a sudden the guitar part that I recorded that was dry through a nice old deluxe has now been put through a Leslie speaker cabinet you know and it doesn't sound anything like what I wanted it to be um, you know I've had that where I've I've had to record guitar parts where I'm sending the amp signals plus a DI sound so you know they'll ask oh can you send us the DI so we can reamp later I just do it because that's what the client wants you know I'm I'm, I'm um, it's the service industry really um, but yeah it, 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 as I said it rarely comes back how you did it you know the first thing they do when they put it into a mix is they lop off all the low end out of your guitar anyway so I try and learn that stuff by listening to a lot of records and kind of trying to give them parts that hopefully they can just plop in the track and they don't have to do any work to them so um, you know that's why I use an EQ pedal for everything so I'm actually tone shaping a lot before I record just so that the part works in the track um, yeah I hope that answers your question but yeah lots of that has happened um, Peter Williams he asked what amp are you using Rob um, I think that was on the Yamaha SA 2200 the uh, 2200 guitar video the amp I used on that uh, you can't see it here but it's it sits right here was my divided by 13 FTR 37 I used that on the whole track um, yeah I just you know I, I I write the idea, you know, come up with the idea, plug into whatever amp I'm plugging into, and then uh, just keep going with the sounds and until I I want a sound out of something else. I don't necessarily switch around amps. I kind of just keep using the same amp with the same sounds and layer in that way. And uh, if I'm not getting something out of that amp, that's when I switch over to a different amp um, or a different plug-in or, or use the Kemper or something. But yeah, uh, that was the FTR 37 by Divided by 13. Really, really lovely amp. I've had it. I've actually owned this amp twice. This is it. It, it left me, and then I sold it, and then uh, bought it back. And I'm glad I did. Um, it's a really, really lovely sounding amp. Big fan of Divided by 13 amps. Really, really cool amps. Um, Fabian. R has uh, said to me, uh, please show your amp settings, EQ for playing funk. Now, I don't really have any EQ for playing funk. and That's the long and short of it. I turn the dials until it sounds good. You know, um, like on my Princeton, the Princeton Reverb's got two EQs. Um, it's got a treble and a bass. And... Treble lives around six because that's where it sounds good on that amp, and the bass goes anywhere between four and six for me. Um, and I tend to use less bass if possible because, as I said, unless I'm doing a guitar part that's naked and it's just a guitar part where you need some low end information in it, I will take the bass out. But then again, also, I don't like a lot of, um, I don't like a lot too much of peaky high end so every amp is different every amp sounds different with their EQ settings so I will just tweak um, you know I, I remember years ago I used to sort of have uh, you know if I'm gigging with like a, a DeVille which I use quite a lot when I used to be gigging um, when I was doing sort of club small club gigs and pop pubs and clubs here I would sort of set the EQ up in a little bit of a smile so that the bass and treble would be around sort of six and seven, and then I would take the middle out a little bit to give that scoopy smile sort of sound. Um, but I tend to do that less, you know, I, I kind of discovered that mid-range is really important on guitar sounds, especially live, you know. Um, so I tend to sort of roll off the bass, roll off the low end a little bit, but but I am always careful not to be too shrill in the high end. I, I like a nice warm high end. I don't want it too piercing. Um, and I 
you know, uh, with the uh, the Boss EQ pedal I use, I, I'm always dipping the, the high end on that that sound to just take off the the shrill top end sounds. So uh, yeah, no real no real uh, EQ settings for funk. It is all is guitar dependent. What guitar you're using? If you're using a three three five, it's obviously gonna you're gonna have a different setting than using a Strat or a Tele. So uh, I can't really help you with that. I do tend to, you know, every time I record, I tend to sort of look at the EQ as I'm as I'm putting it down. Live-wise, you know, you're playing with an amp and you're kind of using a sound for the whole gig most of the time. So I would normally set my amps, my amp EQs, depending on what it sounded like, where I'm stood, you know. Um, so, yeah, hope that answers your question. Uh, the next one I have here is... Drums 15. Uh, Drums 15 has said, Hey Rob, really digging your channel. Thank you very much. Uh, just started picking up funk guitar these past few months, and these lessons have helped a lot in my playing. Oh, that's really sweet of you to say. I was wondering if you'd go through your chord progression for Cosmic Girl live in Verona. God, that was a good gig. That was fun. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that, and, uh, but I remember that gig all day in Verona, Italy. We're playing this amazing amphitheatre in Verona. Beautiful sunshine all day long. And we step on stage and this thunderstorm happens. And uh, we, uh, yeah, it just rained. It was like a two and a half hour show. It rained for the whole show. Completely poured down with rain. Um, we had the crew guys, the, the literally running up and lifting the wedges up and tipping the water out of the speakers. Um, I had a plastic sheet on my uh, on my pedal board. And, uh, yeah, we were thinking they're going to pull the plug. This isn't safe to be playing out here. But they didn't. You know, it, it ended up kind of making the gig. But, yeah, it was. It was hairy. So, uh, yeah, it wants to look at the chord progression for Cosmic Girl live in Verona in a future video. Oh, well, I can show you now because it's not... It's not, um, I'm going to just switch my amp on here, excuse the noise, there it is, it's my little Princeton, I don't know what's going on there, but it's a little bit noisy. Um, so, it's an E minor 7, and then it's a F sharp minor 7, B7, I call this a B7 sharp 5 flat 9. So I'm just playing that, 3, 4... So, as you can see, I'm kind of just playing the top three, four strings. I'm not playing. I'm not playing. I'm not playing all six strings. I kind of concentrate the picking hand, the strumming hand. So how I fret that chord is my first finger is barring the seventh fret of the D, G, B, and E strings. And my second finger bars the eighth fret of the G, B, and E. So I get that sound. Okay, and the strumming for it is really easy. It's just a one E and a down up, down up, down up, down up, down up, down up. So three, four. Then the second half of it. I'm adding my fourth finger to play the octave of the uh, of the, uh, the flat and seventh in the minor seven chord here. So I do that twice, and then the second to the F sharp minor seven chord, like that. I add my fourth finger, so I get this sound, and then I'm going back to the the uh, B seven sharp five flat nine. Um, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Sorry, uh, got that mistake in there. Yeah, I'm not doing B7 sharp 5 flat 9 the second time. I forget myself because I, when I'm playing it, I'm not thinking of chord names. Um, it's what this voicing is. It's like a B7. Well, it is a B7. First finger barring again the seventh fret of the G, the D, G, B, and E. My second finger is only fretting the eighth fret of the G string. And my fourth finger is playing 
it reaches out to the 11th fret of the E string and I'm playing the octave of the, the third there and then I do this I play one E and A uh, and take it off on the A uh. so you get this so all the way through three four The, uh, the verse section uh, says later on in the in the, the comment are you vamping on the root octave in the chorus that parts it so well the whole band cheers and happy holidays cool that's uh, yeah thank you so what later on what I've come to play at the end of the song is uh, in the chorus I'm playing an octave thing here, uh, so I'm playing it's a C sharp. So it's uh, the, my first finger is on the eleventh fret of the D string, my fourth finger is on the fourteenth fret of the B, and what I'm doing is I'm playing an octave like that with all the strings muted, but I'm also dancing between the uh, my second finger, which goes to the twelfth fret of the B and it's going between the, the, the 12th and the 14th fret of the B. So I get this. You can see my thumbs over the top of the neck, like so. And yeah, it's just... That's what I kind of do, you know, I'm just staying out of the way really. The chords are all being taken care of by by the keyboards. Um, loads of stuff going on in that track. So I, I keep the guitar sort of, I always think of it as like a just a high string line when I'm playing octaves. Just something that's a constant grooving thing that goes there. But it's up in the higher registers and uh, it just helps with some rhythmic element and just like a constant thing. So uh, yeah, that's what that part is. Um, so uh, next thing I've had, next comment I've had, question is Elkan Music, who has said, uh, sorry I didn't discover your work before, that's all right, you're allowed to discover when you discover, that's fine by me. Um, but now I'm out here, great video walkthrough, maybe bit, a bit of an explanation about why you do the up down strokes, when, what and why. Okay, so. Um, I have talked about this before, but I don't. I never mind talking about it. I'm going to put my noisy amp back on again. No, I'll, I'll wait. I'll switch it on in a second. How it works for me is it's. I think of the the strumming hand and the picking hand, with sixteenths semiquavers are like a pendulum. Okay, so if I'm doing, if I'm doing down strokes at one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and like that one one and two and three and four and for your hand to go down twice in a row it has to come back up again okay so you get this one and two and three and four and okay dicka, 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 dicka. right now that works with picking as well My rule is my rule it's just how I do it and how I've, I've got used to doing it is I feel that if you're doing that keeping your hand moving constantly like that there's less chance that you're so rhythmic patterns come from that if you change the speed of your hand like say you've got this uh, this feel Right, you can see my hand. I'm going like that. I'm doing a lot more than I'm, I'm only hitting two events. One, two, three, 
right. for. I'm only hitting da ba, but my hand is going da da. So I'm going down, up, down, up, right? Now, if I wanted to play that as that's actually more difficult, just doing it as downstrokes, because and and it, I, I do believe you should be able to do it both ways. But by keeping your hand swinging down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, any of those events, I'm going to turn this buzzing off. It's getting on my nerves. Any of any event that happens, you're going to be completely in time. As long as your hand isn't slowing or speeding up, you're going to be completely in time. So, um, you know, when I I'm going to try and show you what I mean by this. There's a great riff on a uh, on a Michael Jackson tune. It's a horn riff. Um, I think it's... I don't know what song it is. Right. Now, if I was trying to do that as... Doing it where I haven't got my regimented pick strokes, if I slow this down, three, four. As you can see, my hand is just doing that all the time. The down strokes and up strokes are decided because those events happen to happen on those 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 beats, those those uh um, divisions of the note it's already preordained that that note's going to be an upstroke because of where it sits timing wise your hand is just doing it your hands just it's just like imagine it's just like a machine that is being brought towards the strings to go digger 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 that's how I feel about it that's why I choose I'm not choosing the downstrokes the 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 note events are the things that dictate where whether it's going to be a downstroke or an upstroke so to really simplify it look I'm going to play a single D here. So all I hear is ba 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 ba. Now if I add that ba 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 ba. I'm not. My brain isn't going down 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 up down up down up I'm not I don't even think about it my hand just does it That's just a, a, a very silly little funky riffing groove thing that I just came up with there. I wouldn't have time to think about whether I'm playing downstrokes or upstrokes. And the reason I don't have to do that is because my hand has got so used to down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. So I hope that answers your questions. Um, your question, um, Elkan Music. Uh, one last question here before I go. Uh, James G. Robertson. Great lesson, dude. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, do I use a do you use a compressor for all these funk licks? Nope, not all the time. Um, I don't I don't have a compressor on my pedal board. I used to have one constantly. Um, when I'm playing, unless the sound requires completely even, I mean the, the idea of using a compressor is, you know, to, to, when you're using compressor is is to keep everything even dynamically um, and it helps to, in recording to have some in, in a recording for it to be placed evenly now um, I used to use a compressor I don't anymore because I like to be able to control my own dynamic range I really I really find it important especially live if I want to play softer I'm going to play softer and it's going to be quieter I, I want that control myself um, uh, the other thing that a compressor does is it takes all your quiet playing and makes it louder. So it makes right when you've got a dynamic range like that, you know, where you've got the soft 
bits here and the louder bits here, what it will do is it squeezes it down so it's a much more sort of narrow lane. So, so it fits sonically in whatever arrangement you're playing in. Now that is cool because I do that after I've recorded. I, I want to have the choice after I've recorded it. Um, so, and also some sounds do sound better when, when they're compressed. Some parts sound better, better when they're compressed. But I, as a rule, don't tend to record with a compressor before the amp. I may use one after I've recorded. I may record into a compressor like uh, an 1176 or something like that or a, or a DBX 160 which I use, you know, um, I've got the, the hardware versions here, but I tend to use the plugins nowadays because um, the U Universal Audio versions of those are so good, they're so similar to the one I've got here, that actually it's just a lot simpler for me, the way I work so quick. Um, the plugin just does the job just as well, but don't use a compressor all the time. Um, Nothing wrong with using one if you want to use one. It's just my personal choice. I just found it was probably the compressors that I had um, that I was. It was changing the tone a little bit too much for me. It was almost making the the tone a little bit, introducing some high end that I that I didn't particularly want. Saying that, I do have some great pedal compressors, and I will use them. Say if I'm doing a slide part or I want something to use the compression as an effect, a real effect. Um, and where I, you know, I've used the phrase squash the snot out of it before. Um, I've done that and I still do that as well. But um, on my pedal board, I don't have one. Um, maybe I should get a bigger pedal board and get one on there. Um, I have, I don't know if you, any of you people have just seen the new, um, the new Universal Audio pedals that they've just brought out. I am, um, they brought out a, a super reverb one and a delay one and a modulation one and uh, I will uh, definitely, when I can afford it, be uh, denting my credit card with buying some of those things because uh, they do sound magnificent. But um, thanks for sending in the questions. Uh, anyone else has got any more questions? Please don't be uh, don't be uh, shy. Send them in and I'll get to them eventually. Please stay safe out there, everyone and. Um, we are going to be okay. We're going to get through this, um, I hope. And what do I know? You know, what do I know? But um, to anyone new here, uh, thanks for having a look around. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Subscribe button. I can't even talk. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell uh, so you get an alert every time I release a new video. Take care and see you soon.